Okay, so we talked about, let's see, we talked about Langshaus, and then that was the end of the diagonalization part. Okay, then we talked about product states, which were uh, a state that's not entangled, and how it's actually a little bit hard to tell if something is a product state. An, entang an entangled state is just something that's not a product state. But we also want to have some measurement of how entangled something is. <clears throat> okay, the other thing that we talked about is that we usually think about the entanglement with some dividing line in the system. And we maybe don't worry about the entanglement within each part of the system. We worry about the entanglement across the system. Okay, so you might have two physical objects separated in space. And we, we wouldn't worry about the lots of entanglement that was inside the object. We'd wonder if, if those two things were entangled. Okay, and so then we can define a product state with that dividing line. Okay, but then to, to, to figure out if something is entangled, you need to uh, use the singular value decomposition. So the singular value decomposition, so that would, and we haven't used it yet, but I was just defining first what the singular value decomposition is. It's just a simple matrix factorization that uh, turns a ma any matrix into a product of matrices, a unitary times a diagonal times a unitary. Okay, and uh, the unit, the diagonal has positive uh, elements along the diagonal that are called the singular values. And uh, that's sort of a key part of uh, figuring out entanglement. Okay, so how do you turn that into something about a, a quantum system? Okay, so in, you know, typically chapter one or two of a quantum information book, you might see uh, the Schmidt decomposition. And it really is just sort of applying the singular value decomposition to a quantum system. Okay, so we have a quantum system which is written in terms of the two parts with the dividing line, the left part and the right part. Okay, and the structure of the quantum mechanical wave function is that a general wave function will be able to mix different parts of the two sides. And so there's this psi LR that sums, you sum over all states in the left and the right, and you could have all of these terms coming into the system. And if it's got all of these terms coming into the system, it might be very entangled. <clears throat> Okay, so psi LR is just the wave function written in this basis, but uh, it's got two indices, so we could pretend it's, it's a matrix. Usually in quantum mechanics, matrices are operators. This is still the wave function, we're just gonna look at it as a matrix. Okay, so we do an SVD on this psi LR. And we get a U D tilde V, the same ones that we had before. Um, I've done the tilde one, which means that u and v are, are both uh, unitary. Okay, so let's see what this gives us. Okay, so the normalization of the wave function says that the sum over L and R of psi L R squared is one. That turns out to, uh, because it looks like a matrix, it, it turns out to look at, like the trace of psi dagger psi. And so we'll use that in a little bit. Okay, but now let's uh, take this SVD factorization and use the U and V to define some new states. Okay, so the U and the V are unitary transformations. So if I apply them to the states in this fashion, it gives me another, if the first set is orthonormal, it gives me a new set of states that's also orthonormal. So I start with the left states L, I apply this unitary transformation, so I sum over all the Ls, I have the new states I that are the diagonal elements of D, uh, and I get this left state labeled by I that's a special kind of state. Okay, and I do the same thing for the right side. I take the V tilde, and I sum over all the right states, and I change that basis to, uh, uh, to this uh, uh, I basis. And so then I plug, I, so then I take psi, and uh, so I haven't used these two lines yet. I just insert into the expression for psi the singular value decomposition with the matrix matrix multiplies expanded out in index notation. Okay, then I rearrange the sum to put the V next to the R, and I do that sum on R. And I find that, that I just get this IR piece. Okay, so the R and the V turns into this IR. And I do the same thing with the U and the L. 
Now that turns into the IL piece. And I'm left with a, an expression for the wave function. And it's different from the original expression because it only has one index that gets summed over. So it's got a sum of one index i. It's got the d tilde i i as the coefficient. And then this is, these are the basis states. So these are special basis states that allows the wave function to be written in diagonal form. Okay, so that's a huge improvement over a totally off diagonal form. Now it's diagonal. <clears throat> and this is the Schmidt decomposition. And uh, the d tilde i i, well, those are just the singular values, which we usually call lambda. And so here's our wave function. So this works for any wave function. It depends on how you cut your system in two. You know, sometimes there's one natural cut, two separate systems, or sometimes we just have one system and we make imaginary cuts. As long as you sort of separate the Hilbert space into two parts, like one set of spins and another set of spins, that's fine. <clears throat> Okay, so then this special basis within those two parts makes it diagonal, and it's got simple coefficients. The coefficients are real, and they're um, um, non-negative. Okay, so that's the Schmidt decomposition. So the Schmidt decomposition sort of immediately reveals to you whether the system is entangled. Okay, so let's go back. We have the normalization. Okay, so we, we take this form for the normalization and we plug in the SVD and put it, plug it in for both. Use the, the unitary conditions, use the cyclic properties of the trace, and the U and the, the V both disappear. We're left with two diagonal matrices, which are the same, squared. And so it just gives you, and you trace it, and so it turns into just the sum on I of lambda I squared equals one. Okay, so whenever you see something in physics where you sum it up and you get one, usually think of it as a probability. So this lambda i squared is the probability of a particular state. Uh, it's this state where it's in the Schmidt state i l on the left and the Schmidt state i r on the right. And it's got this diagonal representation. Okay, so suppose Suppose psi happens to be a product state, then it's already in its Schmidt decomposed form. It's in a Schmidt decomposed form where lambda one is equal to one and all the rest of the lambdas are equal to zero. You know, so then it just looks, it just looks like the previous expression for the wave function, except we, we just read off that phi is I L and C is I R. Okay, so product wave function translates to SVD, where you get only one non-zero piece. And that tells you if it's entangled or not. So you just do the SVD on this matrix form of the wave function, and you immediately see if it's entangled. But you also get a lot, usually things are, usually things are entangled, and so then we can try to measure the amount of entanglement by looking at these probabilities. You know, so the closer it is to all the probability being in one guy, that's less entangled. If it's totally spread out among lots of different states, that's very entangled. Okay, so von Neumann came up with the von Neumann entanglement entropy. And uh, it's just plugging these probabilities. How'd I get that? Here we go. It's just plugging these probabilities into the standard statistical mechanics information theory formula for the entropy. Okay, so here it is. Oh, I have a good story about von Neumann. Uh, so if, it's interesting to read the Wikipedia art, art, article on von Neumann because it, you know, they make a pretty good case that he was like the smartest guy of the 20th century. And uh, um, around here, Enrico Fermi is one of the particularly famous uh, great physicists. And uh, one of our emeritus faculty at Irvine was a postdoc with Enrico Fermi. And so he told me this story about Enri somebody talking to Enrico Fermi about von Neumann. So there was another postdoc of Enrico Fermi, and he said to Fermi, you know, I hear von Neumann is like way smarter than anybody else in the world. You know, is that really true? And uh, Fermi said, well, yes, you know, you know how much smarter I am than you? 
Well, that's how much smarter he is than me. <laughs> I don't know if there's anybody around who still knew Enrico Fermi and would say, that, well, that sounds like him. But uh, this, this guy, you know, our, our faculty member, he's retired. He's 80 or so, but he was, he was his postdoc. OK. So, so von Neumann defined this. And uh, there are other types of entropy that have slightly different formulas that are useful also. Um, but uh, this measures the entanglement. So let's look at the case where one of the lambdas is 1 and the rest are 0. Well, that, that gives you entropy of 0. You know, the factor in front kills, outweighs the log. And uh, the most entangled is if all the lambdas are equal. And then it looks like um, something proportional to the number of spins in the system. You know, the, the probabilities of all these states will be like, if they're all equal, will be like 1 over 2 to the n. That'll kill off the log. And so you get, um, in that case, you get something that would be an entropy that's extensive, scales with the size of the system. So the ordinary stat mech entropy isn't quite like this. The, the ordinary stat mech entropy, we sort of think of as a bigger system than the system we're looking at. There's a heat bath. And we're really thinking about the entanglement between the heat bath and the system of interest. Um, but this formula just has the system of interest. And so the regular, and we're usually talking about the ground state. You don't have to, but you're usually talking about the ground state. So this system, the ordinary entropy would be zero. Because if it's in the ground state, it's not entangled with the heat bath. Okay, but we're looking at something different. We're saying the heat bath is itself. It's just the right-hand side of it versus the left. So we cut it in two into just one, uh, one system, and then this defines what this type of entanglement is. It's sort of a more general thing. Okay. So let's look at an example of measuring the entanglement. So um, here's a two spin one halves, and so the natural dividing line is, of course, one spin and the other. <clears throat> and uh, I made up this uh, wave function uh, that has just two pieces of it. It's normalized. The, the formula only works if the wave function is normalized. Okay, so so then this could be uh, one of these exercises. Let's take this wave function and find its, in, its von Neumann entanglement entropy. So the first thing you have to do is write it in matrix form, remembering that it's not an operator. It's this funny left-right thing. You know, and the left and right sides could be of different sizes, so it could be a rectangular matrix. Here it happens to be square. There's nothing that makes it Hermitian or anything. So here's the two probabilities. Here's up, up is 1 over root 2. That's this element. And up, down is this other element. Okay. And uh, you, you can do the SVD. So, of course, you can call it numerically. But we just have to find some way of writing it in the SVD form. Okay. And so you can do that by, in this case, by this sort of trick. Here I've, I've taken the wave function itself. Its top two elements are root two and minus root two, and then it's got zeros. So I've got this, this, the part of the wave function here, but I, I added, added the other piece that would make this unitary, but then I killed this piece off by multiplying by this matrix. Okay? And then I, the, the rest of the trick is to put in a, a U, which is just a diagonal matrix. So that's equal to that. And now it's in SVD form. Okay, so this is sort of a, it's sort of like two by two, you can always figure out by hand how to do it. And this is sort of a little tricky way uh, to do it. Or you can do it more systematically also. Uh, you can form a density matrix, which I'll mention later, and diagonalize it. That's more systematic. <clears throat> OK, so, so here it is. And it's a product state. Right? It's uh, got one singular value. And the other one is 0. OK, and well, what's, what, is, what are the two product states? Well. The, uh, you can see that lamb, you can see that the, the left spin is definitely up. So that's, the left guy is just the up state, and the right hand Schmidt state is up minus down with this factor of 1 over root 2. Okay. <clears throat> so then here are two singular values, 1 and 0, but it's a product state, so you, you do this formula for S and you get 0, and it's unentangled. And there's the, fo the product form right now. OK. Let's make sure this is the last thing. Okay. 
Okay, any, uh, any questions on that? Let's switch over to the next set of slides. Yes. Singular value decomposition. Okay, oh, more, so, okay. So there's two ways to think about the question. So first of all, let's suppose that we had 100 spins. Okay, you don't do the entanglement with each spin. You don't divide it into 100 pieces and do it that way. You have to choose a dividing line. And all that means is you have to tell me which spins are on the left, and then the rest are on the right. Okay. Then you can write the matrix in the psi L R form. The indices L will go over a huge number of possibilities, all the possibilities of that set of spins. So will R. So you have this huge singular value decomposition to do. In most cases, if you do a big system, you know, it won't be practical. It will be sort of the same level of practicality as doing the exact diagonalization, okay? But that's what, in principle what you'd have to do. DMRG gives you a shortcut to it. So you get the, you get the entropy as part of the algorithm. Okay. So, uh, a sort of close cousin of the Schmidt decomposition are reduced density matrices. And that's where, that's part of the name for DMRG, density matrix renormalization group. So here's density matrices, um, or more properly reduced density matrices. So you have the same split between the left and the right sides. Oh, uh, by the way, if you, haven't, if you haven't seen much of density matrices before, uh, Feynman's Lectures on Statistical Mechanics has a wonderful chapter two introduction to them. Talks about examples from polarized light. Um, gives a nice little picture of why you should think about quantum mechanics this way. <clears throat> okay, but uh, so here I'm just going to connect it to the Schmidt decomposition. So I write the wave function in the same form. Okay, and then let's imagine that I want to look at an operator, an operator O that only lifts, lives on the left-hand side. If I take the expectation value of that operator within the state psi, I get these various pieces, but the R doesn't connect to the O, so it goes to the R prime and gives you a Kronecker delta. Okay, and so you're left with a simpler piece involving the left. There is a, still a sum on R left over. So you get rid of the sum on R by defining this reduced density matrix rho that has two indices for the left, an L prime and an L, and it sums over all the R states. So you call it uh, tracing out R. <clears throat> then uh, with this rho, there's a simple expression for the expectation value psi. It only involves rho and the operator, and it's just trace of rho times O. So, and this works, we didn't use any properties of O in doing this derivation. So it works for any operator. Any operator that you want to look at on the left-hand side to figure out what's going on the left-hand side, you can find out what it is by tracing it with rho. So rho has all the information about the left-hand side for any operator that one is. The only thing that rho doesn't have is how it's connected, how it's entangled to the right-hand side, but it encapsulates everything on the left-hand side. Okay, so that's a, that's a nice thing. That's a density matrix. Um, it's a, you know, got some other things about it that I don't have time to talk about, like um, states that are mixed. But, uh, so rho is Hermitian, and so you can diagonalize it. So here's a little exercise, uh, an analytic exercise, that uh, suppose we diagonalize rho, and I can, I can um, do rho by tracing out the right, and I get rho left. Or I can trace out the left and get rho right. And it's sort of just a transpose. It, the, the rho is, is not a transpose, but you just transpose psi, and it switches between them. <clears throat> so they're closely related. So the exercise is to show that the eigenvalues of rho L are the same as for rho R. And they're just lambda I squared from the Schmidt decomposition. Okay, so these are essentially the same thing. It's just a different way of writing. These singular values, which we interpreted as probabilities, just become the eigenvalues of the density matrix. And the interpretation is the same. 
the lambda i squareds gives you the probability of the left state being in this i l state. Okay. <clears throat> So uh, in DMRG programs, this actually translates to you can write the program diagonalizing a density matrix, or you can write the program doing an SVD. And you know, typical program might have the option for doing either one. They each have some advantages. But it's really a tiny technical difference. It's really just the same thing. Okay, so what do we know now? We know how to calculate the entanglement entropy, the von Neumann entanglement entropy. And we can think about doing it for a spin chain, the same spin chains that you were working to diagonalize. Okay, so, so what would we do? So we, we think of a Heisenberg chain with open boundary conditions, spin one half, out to size n. Okay, we diagonalize that. Uh, we have to decide where to split it. Well, the, if you split it towards the end, it'll give you a small entanglement. So we usually split it down the middle to get the biggest entanglement to see what's really going on. Okay, so we, we divide it in two, and so I'll only think about uh, chains with an even number of sites. Okay, so here's the recipe. So we divide it in two. So we, first we find the ground state with the exact diagonalization. We rewrite that first ground state eigenvector, splitting the, the, the spins that are on the left from the spins on the right. And then we lump all the spins on the left into one index and the ones on the right into, to the right index and treat it like a matrix. So we rewrite it in terms of the left and right basis states so it looks like a matrix. It sort of absorb all the individual spins into a single index on each side. Then we do this SVD, this call SVD, look at the singular values, square them and add them up with the log thing, and uh, you get this entanglement entropy. Okay, so this is a program that uh, you know, a lot of you are almost ready to do if you like almost had time to finish that, that general N diagonalization. And so here's what you get. Okay, and so here's a more advanced exercise for, uh, for the weeks ahead if you have time. Um, you can try to uh, verify this table with Julia. Okay, but so here's uh, the, all the even sizes out to 14. Um, and with DMRG, we can just keep going on this table to any size you want, pretty much. But here it is with just a simple diagonalization. So here's the entanglement entropy. Um, for size 2, the exact answer is log 2. So this 0.69 is log 2. Okay? <clears throat> it's also the maximal possible entanglement entropy. So if you, if you make all of the Schmidt states equally probable, that's the most entanglement you can have. That's got a simple formula of n over 2 log 2. So that's the most you can have. And so then we can ask the question, okay, how big is the entanglement entropy compared to the biggest it could be? The system's getting bigger, the, system, the state is getting more and more complicated. Maybe it gets more and more entanglement. No, it doesn't. The entanglement is hardly changing here. Okay, so the maximum is growing with n, and so here it's up to 5, but we're still around 0.76 versus starting out at 0.69. It's actually growing as the log of the system size, very slowly. We, that's one of the things that we've learned in the last 10 or 15 years, exactly how this works. <clears throat> Goes as the log. There's also an alternation, which gives us a clue about what the system is doing. It's like, why should, they're all even, why should uh, it alternate big, small, big, small, big, small, big? Okay, well, you can understand that in terms of an RVB picture of the ground state. So what the, so if you have two spins, the ground state is in this singlet state, and it's got a nice low energy. And on bigger systems, it, it it makes a very complicated state, but it, it's got a lot in common with just putting down these singlets. So here's, I've made a fat line for each singlet, and here's two spins, and it's the exact singlet. If I have n equals 4, it looks a little bit like a singlet on the left and a singlet on the right. Okay, now the singlet has log 2 of entanglement in it, but if the singlet is sitting entirely in the left, it doesn't matter. It's entangled within the left. We only care about the connections. 
So this n equals 4 should have a very low entanglement because it looks like two singlets. And that, that is what we find. We find this 0.32, which is not zero, so this is just sort of a cartoon-like picture. Yes? It would always be log 2 because this is, um, it would always be exactly log 2. Uh, the reason is, is that it's a, it's a, it's a symmetric wave function between up and down. And so the, the, if you cut it not in, sorry, if you cut it so it only has one site, which is all you can do for n equals 4, then the one site can, is, has two equally probable states, up and down. That's all that matters. So the entanglement entropy is always governed by the smaller system. And so in this case, for even numbers of sites, cutting it just for one site is always log 2. Okay, and then if you move the cut steadily to the center, there's a particular form that it takes. And there's an analytic prediction for this in the large n limit, and a lot of it's known about this. Yes? <clears throat> so RV, thanks. Uh, RVB is resonating valence bond state. So this singlet here is called a valence bond in just other language. And um, what, one way to represent this type of state is it's a superposition of valence bonds in all different places. And that's called a resonating valence bond state. And uh, this idea dates back to uh, Linus Pauling in the context of uh, chemical rings, that the quantum mechanical state can look like that. But it really came into physics with Phil Anderson proposing it as a possible ground state for frustrated spin systems. And uh, so for, he proposed it for the triangular lattice. It's now a good description of the Kagame uh, spin liquid lattice, which I'll show some results for. Okay. <clears throat> so in this, I'm not actually letting these resonate because in 1D, they, they really can't move around with open boundary conditions. They're kind of stuck from the end. So you can only write one pattern of these bonds. It, it pairs up the sites. So for n equals 6, one of the singlets, one of the bonds, is in the middle, and so you're cutting it in two. So you get that extra entanglement of cutting that guy in two. And so six is big. And so it depends on whether you're a multiple of four or not, whether you cut the guy in the middle, and that gives you um, the, uh, this alternation. You can have further neighbor singlets, but the near neighbor singlets are directly in the Hamiltonian. So, you know, we, if we put in a J prime, it would try to make next neighbor singlets. We didn't put that in, so it's trying to lower the energy. And so it tries to make every neighbor pair a singlet. But it can't. Once you make it a singlet with one guy, it can't talk to anybody else. So it has to do some sort of combination of fluctuating guys that's mostly near neighbor, but sort of fluctuating around. But it does have beyond nearest neighbor. And you know, these numbers aren't going down to zero. They're sort of mixing up. And as it goes farther away from the ends, the, the effects of the ends that pin it in one particular location dies off. And the even odd alternation gets smaller and smaller. <clears throat> OK. So the, let, now let's talk about why this entanglement <clears throat> is so small compared to what it could be. Okay, there's something called the area law. And laws in physics usually are something that's uh, usually true, mostly true. Theories are, can be always true. Laws are like, you know, there's Hooke's law for springs. That's like just a little Taylor series. Um, so this is, the area law is, is better than Hooke's law. But it's, it's uh, you know, you have to be very careful about how you define the system to make it true. And there's been some wonderful work um, proving the area law in certain, certain circumstances, particularly by Hastings. <clears throat> uh, but uh, um, what it says, so one of the things, that it's, it, let's see, log corrections are not going to be considered here. They are sometimes present. But what the statement is, is that if you have a, the ground state of a system, with this division of A plus B, but it's really all connected. Um, then the entropy is proportional to the area of the boundary. And that's why it's the area law. 
And its, it's area makes you think of, uh, you know, three dimensions with a cut makes it an area. But uh, so the name isn't quite, uh, it's a little misleading. But in 1D, you divide the system in two and you say, what's the, what's the number of sites on the edge? And it's really only one, no matter how long you make the system. So this, the area law would say that S is a constant because the cut only has one site on it. If we go to two dimensions, um, S would be proportional to the length of the line here. And so it would be proportional to LY for an LX by LY system. It wouldn't depend on LX. And 3D, you, I didn't draw it, but you have some 3D thing and you cut it in the middle and there's an area. And the entropy should be proportional to that. Okay, and so I can use the RBB picture to give a pictorial justification for that, which is here in 2D. And the key observation is that these singlets that are on the entirely in the left or entirely in the right don't matter. So I draw some sort of singlet pattern. Here I did it sort of organized, but it could be more random. And then I say, okay, now I do a cut, and I say how many of those singlets are going to cut, be cut by the line. Here I lined them up so that the, all of them in the line were, it could be half of them or something. Um, and you can see that the, the ones that are cut are, it's, it's proportional to the area of the line, or the area, the, the area of the boundary. And so that's where the area law comes from. It's just sort of using the singlet picture saying the interior of this guy doesn't talk to the interior of that guy in a typical ground state. Okay, but there's a, there's, this sort of gives you the picture that, okay, this kind of makes sense in this RVB type of language. It doesn't give you a sense that it should always be true. And of course, there are cor log corrections to this. Uh, but this is a sort of, you know, detailed research area that people have thought a lot about. There's a lot to know about this. But each of these singlets that were cut would contribute their log 2 to the uh, to S, and it would just add that up. Okay, so the area law is the thing that makes DMRG work. It says, the area law tells us that, so the biggest, biggest uh, entropy would be the volume, a volume law. And if the volume law applied, DMRG wouldn't work at all. But the entropy is a lot smaller, and that allows us to throw away states. Okay, and so that's the next section. How do we throw away states if the entanglement is small? Okay, so truncating low probability states. So the first thing is that if the von Neumann entanglement entropy is small, that means that there has to be a bunch of states with nearly zero probability. So here's a little schematic plot of the lambda squared versus the index i. And I've made it so that it's just getting really close to zero beyond a few of these. So this would be a low entanglement state. And I'm imagining that these guys over here are really small, like 10 to the minus 6 or 10 to the minus 10. And we're willing to make that sort of error, so we throw them away. Okay, so here's the Schmidt decomposition of our state. And it goes all the way up to the full size of the system, 2 to the n over 2. And we say, no, I'm going to throw away all the guys to the right of my pointer and just keep them up. They say there's m of them, little m. And so I'm going to keep those, and this is my approximation. And m can be much less than m over 2. Okay, and this is just like that approximation of a matrix directly from a singular value decomposition where you only keep a certain number of rows and columns. It's exactly the same. Okay, so then that, this truncation, which cuts down this, the, the, it compresses the system exponentially. You know, 2 to the n over 2 goes down to something like 100 or 1,000, <clears> where n is maybe 100 or 1,000 itself. So 2 to the n is huge. <clears throat> so this is the basic idea of DMRG. So um, it uh, uh, uses the density matrix or the Schmidt decomposition, finds the lambdas, and uses that to truncate down the system. Okay, but but uh, this what I've told you so far isn't enough, <clears throat> because in order to get the Schmidt decomposition, we need the wave function. But we're trying to get the wave function, so it's like a chicken and the egg. If you had the wave function, you could compress it down to something small, but you don't have it. So how can you compress it? It's like we call this a chicken and the egg problem. Which came first, the chicken or the egg? 
Anybody know the answer? Eggs. Dinosaurs had eggs. Uh, and how did it? How did? How did the? How did evolution solve the chicken and the egg problem? Uh, it did. Uh, it iteratively improved till we got a chicken egg, a chicken and an egg. It started with primitive features with crude eggs, and it gradually evolved everything together in a self-consistent way till it got to a chicken and an egg. And uh, that's what we do in DMRG. It's the exact same thing. We start off with something that's like, wait, how can you have one without the other? How can, we don't have the wave function, so how can we get the Schmidt decomposition? So what you do is you build it up together and self-consistently. So the, the term RG comes from the historical uh, background of DMRG. So Ken Wilson had a, a numerical RG method that was used for the condo impurity and worked great for other uh, uh, impurity problems. And um, so that numerical RG looked much more like a, a traditional RG, but it was a numerical Im implementation. And um, so DMRG fixes that by introducing the density matrix as a fix. Okay, and back then, I didn't know about quantum information. Quantum information, you know, was just starting. And so there was sort of a duplication of ideas in DMRG and ideas of quantum information at the same time. And then, at some point, they came together. Um, and we, we learned about each other. And uh, so now I'm describing you something that is not the way I could have described it 20 years ago. I'm using the ideas of entanglement and quantum information because that's the way we think about it now. But uh, 20 years ago, I would have said, oh, this, this is an RG method. And it's altered by the usual RG method to make it work by this density matrix. And so it doesn't look quite as much like an RG method. So because it's drifted away from traditional RG methods, you know, the name is sort of old. Um, you still think about it that way, and RG is still a big part of this whole field. But now we think of the best RG of this type is a different tensor network called the MIRA. So that's a that's a bit long story. Okay. Yes. Oh well, it needs a name that's catchy, and DMRG worked, and uh, so. You should still use that, but uh, uh, you know you have to think about what name. If you find something, you need to get a good name, and some people are not very good at it, and uh, you know has to have a good sound, and you know this this worked. So um, you know, and it was the way it was the way uh, the way I figured it out. So, uh, but uh, let's see, matrix product states is the heart of DMRG. And then the other part of DMRG is the way you iteratively optimize it. And so you'd have to have a name that included like iterative optimization of matrix product states via the Langshows method, something, you know, something horrible like that. Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, so the solution here is, involves doing the Schmidt de decomposition not just on the middle, but everywhere you can. So, you don't just lump the sites into left and right. You give them an order, like they're a one-dimensional chain, one through n. And then you draw a dividing line between one and two, between two and three, three and four, et cetera. And you, do, you think about doing the Schmidt decompositions on every dividing line. Each dividing line gives you a big compression of the wave function. So you do them all. And in the end, you're left with something that uh, is very small. It's really highly compressed. So if you just do it in the middle, the compression you get is like the square root of the size. You, know, you sort of cut the system in half. But if you do it on every side, it just completely kills off the exponential and gives you something much smaller. So that's the first step. Okay, and and so you know we, we have to work up a little bit to this. And then the second step is you want to optimize. So this gives us, when we cut it at every possible place, this gives us something called the matrix product state, which I'll explain. And then we optimize the matrix product state to minimize the energy. And you always, so it's like working with the wave function, but always in compressed form. And you, it's like you have a zipped up file, and you can access a little bit of it and unzip it and look at it 
and then zip it back up and move over and unzip the rest. But if you unzip it all at once, it'll be exponentially large, so you can't do that. So that's sort of the way it works. Okay, so I'll, I'll get to that, but first I have to talk about the diagrams. <clears throat> so the algebra of matrix product states gets a little bit messy, and it gets even worse if you do generalizations uh, for higher dimensions. And uh, so one of the things that uh, some of the people who came from quantum information and started working on this, you know, they were used to uh, quantum circuit diagrams. And so they started doing circuit diagrams for, for DMRG, and it made everything much easier. And uh, so we use these all the time. <clears throat> okay, so, so how do these diagrams work? Okay, so here's a wave function for four spins. And uh, the diagram for that is a box which represents the wave function. And the external legs that come out are just, each one has a spin attached to it. And the total size of this thing, each one has a factor of two, so it's two to the four. Two to the four numbers in this box. And so this just is the representation for psi of S1 through S4. Okay, so suppose we had something that only had two legs coming out. So every external leg like this, and there's some dot or box in the center, this is a tensor with two indices, well that's a matrix. So we're not gonna use any of the mathematical properties of tensors in coordinate systems. Um, we'll just call something with lots of indices a tensor. And so here's a matrix, a vector has one index coming out. Here's a three-leg tensor, which we'll use a lot of. Okay, so those are some of our basic units. Okay, so let's use this to write down a, t uh, a, a diagram for this simple matrix multiply. So I've got a matrix A and a matrix B, I say A times B is C. Okay, so first I go to the summation convention, say Cij equals Aik bkj, so k is the internal link that gets summed over. Okay, so here's the diagram for this. So c, the tensor, just has these two external legs, i and j. And then a times b has this, and there's a leg that's internal, and it's just like Feynman diagrams for QED, um, the internal legs get summed over, or you know, integrated over in, in diagrams in, in the field theory, but summed over here. And uh, so that's, that's uh, a matrix multiplying. So the rule is you contract over all the interior indices and all the external ones are determining the answer that you have. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, yeah. Or the, you know, there's, there's different, uh, let's see, I'm not sure of the, all the right terminology but uh, there's something that just gives you, you know, the number of indices. That's the number of legs. Yes. Uh huh. Uh huh. Right. Well, I, I, uh, that will, that, that's like eating one cookie or one potato chip. You can't just have one. You can't just have five minutes on spooky action at distance. I love to lecture about that in my uh, quantum mechanics class, but we spend a, you know, a week or so on it, and uh, so we can talk about it one on one, but. Uh, I don't want to try to get into that, uh, especially right, right now. <clears throat> okay, uh, so, so that's, that's the simple form of these diagrams, but suppose you, you say, well, what does the Schmidt decomposition look like? Okay, so you take one matrix and you expand it out. So it's like the reverse of this. There's a diagonal matrix in here which can sort of be absorbed onto the left side or the right side. So you can put a little dot in here or not. It doesn't do very much. But uh, this is the Schmidt decomposition. But if this index i has, is real, goes over a very small range, this is a big improvement. So suppose that L goes from one to a million, and R goes from one to a million. The whole matrix is, 12, is, is uh, 10 to the 12 elements. 
But if I do the Schmidt decomposition, and if I goes from 1 to 10, I've reduced it down to a 10 million plus a 10 million matrix. So 10 to the 7 instead of the 10 to the 12. So this is a big compression. And uh, so that's what that looks like. So in general, we want to take these complicated tensors and cut them in two and insert, do the SVD and, and assume that there's a small dimension that goes in. Okay. Okay, so the matrix product state is when you do this SVD at every possible step. So suppose we started with four sites, and here's the wave function for four sites. And I first step I cut it in two. And I have this extra I2 index. The two just goes to this. That's where I cut it. And uh, so this index is small. So I've actually cut the size of the problem by taking its square root, essentially. OK, and then I take each side on the left. I take the left side, and I cut that in two with another singular value decomposition. And I cut the right-hand side with another singular value decomposition. And I've got something that's totally spread out. And there's only a few legs on each tensor. So this has four tensors. And the edge ones only have two indices. And the middle ones have three. You know, the, mid the middle ones are like a line and then one coming down. And that's a matrix product state. And we usually just sort of quickly write it like a comb like this. Uh, but every time there's a junction here, there, that means there's a tensor living in that place. And it's a three, uh, uh, rank three tensor, except on the edges. So that's a matrix product state. So the storage, <coughs> so, so this is an approximation to a wave function. And it's an approximation that works great if there's low enough entanglement. If there's high entanglement, it totally fails. But if there's low entanglement, it'll work great. So the storage, if it works great, you know, you go from 2 to the n down to about n tensors, and each of them are m squared. They look like matrices. Um, here, here's what each one looks like. The indices i will say are m. So it's m by m plus another index that only goes over up and down. So 2m squared. <clears throat> so we have, I left out the 2, but n m squared times 2. And so that's an exponential compression. Yeah. So th there's a truncation that uh, came. So you decide how much probability you're going to throw away. Maybe you throw away everything less than 10 to the minus 8. You know, that's a typical number for DMRG. Throw away 10 to the minus 8. So then your, your answer is only good to 8 digits. Well, that's fine. <laughs> Is it what is it? It's yes, yeah, it's very well. It's well, very well behaved. I mean, we we understand a lot about it. You have to talk about be a little bit more specific, but it generally it's very well behaved. Um, when you do the, you know, there's details about how you do the SVD, which I don't want to get into. Um, you know, you sort of have to. It's like sort of a putting in a gauge to the pieces as you go along to make it especially well behaved. Uh, but it's basically just keeping everything orthonormal on the sides before you do a singular value decomposition. But as, as long as you do that, it, do that, it works very well. Um, some of the other tensor network methods should work really well in principle, but they, they have, they're less controlled numerically than DMRG, so they have some trouble that uh, makes them a little bit difficult to work with. Uh, one more detail about doing the SVD. You know, so when I did the first cut, and I did an SVD. I wanted to think of that as a matrix that I cut in two. But the left side had two indices. So I wanted to treat the two indices as one. And so that's I, the, this little uh, three-leg thing I call a combiner. It's uh, some call, sometimes called something with fusion. There's, there's different names for it. Um, but it, it puts two indices together and gives you a one index coming out. But the, there's no loss. There's no truncation. It's like if you have two and two going in, it just relabels it as four, one to four. So it's like here's here's an index that you know if these two guys go into that, it's like just relabeling them like this. So it looks like one index, and then it makes it into you call your SVD with this form, so it just looks like a matrix. So you combine all of the indices on the left into one, and then uh, all of them on the right into one, and do an ordinary SVD. 
Okay. So then DMRG is an MPS wave function optimized by an iterative sweeping Langshaus plus Schmidt decomposition algorithm. So it's got all of it's got these pieces that we were uh, working on, um, and uh, but it, it keeps it in this compressed form and sweeps back and forth until it uh, uh, converges directly in the compressed form, the matrix product form. Um, okay, and I put up some references here. Uh, so the I worked the the original PRL is pretty short. Uh, I worked pretty hard on the PRB, and so people were able to really do the algorithm based on the long PRB. Um, but uh, more recently, uh, Uli Scholwak has written two nice reviews. One was in RevMod Fizz in 2005. But then subsequent to that, the matrix product language really took off. And uh, so he has this uh, second one that is a good place to start in Annals of Physics that is titled something like DMRG in the, in the era of matrix product states. Um, <clears throat> Frank Pullman is coming in a week or so. And he's also going to be talking about DMRG, but some more advanced topics that I won't get to. Uh, so he's an expert in DMRG, and so is Bella Bauer. He'll come um, uh, maybe in the last week. And so they'll be, both be here uh, later, and uh, uh, I have to get to another conference tomorrow morning, so you won't see me after tonight. Okay, so the basic steps of DMRG. Okay, so we have this matrix product state, and we focus on two tensors to improve. Um, it works better to have two to improve rather than try to improve one at a time because they, they talk to each other and it helps, makes them go faster. So two of them together look like this four index guy. Okay, and alpha goes over this interior index, but it's really going over a Schmidt state for a cut right there. And beta goes over the Schmidt states on the right. And uh, so these are both size M. And then you have two sizes of two. So it's about four m squared object that you work with. OK, you do Langshaus on this guy. So this guy is not in its ground state. If you do Langshaus, you can make it have lower energy. You can replace the wave function here. So you treat this little tensor thing as a wave function. Um, it's a wave function in a reduced basis. So you can treat it um, as just an ordinary wave function. You can lower its energy with this exact diagonalization step with Langshaus. Okay, so it turns psi into a psi prime, and it makes it look like a, just one four index tensor instead of a product of two guys. Um, it sort of erases the, the product nature that it had, but it lowers the energy. Psi prime has a lower energy than psi. Then you do a Schmidt decomposition to split it back up. And so it turns this guy into that. Uh, and you put this back into the MPS, because now it lo just looks like two links again, but it's, it's better links. Okay. Then you shift over by one site, um, and you repeat. Okay, so you work your way from site one, two, two, three, you go all the way to the end. Then you reverse and go back. All the time you're reducing the energy, but keeping it in the, you're only briefly for two sites out of the matrix product form, then you go right back. And then you, re then you keep going back and forth. Each back and forth is called a sweep. And you repeat it however many times you uh, have time for or until it converges or until you run out of computer time. Um, but the number of times you might go back and forth for a, um, for a spin chain might be only three or four, two even. It converges really fast. For a bigger challenging system, you might do dozens of times. But usually it's not so many. So it's a, it's a nicely converging uh, procedure. <clears throat> OK, so uh, what I want to switch to now is this is the end of the sort of what I would do as a Blackboard lecture if we had a lot of time. But I'm going to switch over to one of my standard you know, a talk that I gave uh, in June in Brazil. And now, hopefully, with this background, you're sort of ready to understand, you know, DMRG as you would hear it in a in a regular talk. 
And there'll be a number of interesting new things along the way. You know, it'll uh, uh, go a little bit faster now, but you'll sort of see a, a lot more of what we can do. Okay, so I'm sort of jumping forward, skipping some historical stuff. And starting with this slide that I love to show, which is just talking about entanglement entropy. And it comes from a 12-side exact diagonalization just like you could do now. Or if you work a little bit harder, you can do in a, in a day or two. Okay, so here's, <clears throat> I took an 8-side chain, diagonalized it. I took a 12-side chain, diagonalized it. I got every, not just the ground state, but I got every energy level. And I did the Schmidt decomposition on each of those states. Okay, so the Schmidt decomposition isn't a property of the ground state. You can put any state into the Schmidt decomposition and calculate its entanglement entropy. And we were just seeing how low the entanglement entropy is for the ground state. But suppose you look at the other states. So the first thing you see, of course, is that, boy, if I draw all these levels, it just turns black. The energy spacing between levels becomes exponentially small. You know, and it, you really can't distinguish these states up here. They're kind of uh, weird pathological states. Um, but uh, here's the entanglement entropy that you get for all of these states on the 12-site system. And it's plotted versus energy. So the ground state has the red circle on it. And you can see how that is a low entanglement entropy. And uh, what does it look like? It looks like it's below, it's a little bit below 0.5. So it's, it's small. <clears throat> um, but then this n over 2 log 2 we saw on the table, that's the maximum possible. That's up here. And so the, the ones in the middle, the black area here, those go up pretty close to the maximum. You know, there's a little bit that keeps from going to the maximum, things like uh, conservation of angular momentum. They can't quite get up to the maximum, but basically they get huge entanglement. Um, now, the, this system, this, these Heisenberg chains, if you, if you ask, you know, well, is this a strongly correlated system or not? You know, people would say, oh, yes, it's a strongly correlated system. There's no way that you could think about treating it with just a simple mean field theory. But um, in terms of entanglement, it's very unentangled, but it's not, not near zero. So this is sort of a strongly correlated ground state. <clears throat> Over here, the maximum energy has zero entanglement. Can anybody tell me why, what those two start states are with zero entanglement? Ferromagnetic. Now, why aren't they degenerate? I put in a little random field I didn't tell you about to split degeneracies. So just a tiny little field uh, to, to make all the circles separate. Random field. Okay, so that, otherwise these should be at exactly the same energy up and down. Okay, but then all the guys in the middle are, are huge. Okay, so this is a, a fundamental difference. DMRG does not work for states in the middle in an ordinary system. The entanglement is not small, it gets big. Um, there's nothing that works to, to get one state here. Now, it, in fact, in, there is an exception to that, which is if you have strong disorder, you can have a many-body localized state. You might hear about this uh, later on, I'm not sure, but in this, uh, this uh, school. But uh, there are certain types of states that everybody has low entanglement. And that's because they have this little disorder field. I just put a tiny thing, you put a huge thing on, and it'll make everything low entangled. And then there's a, a couple of papers that just have come out in the last week or so telling you how to do DMRG in that case, even for high energy states. And uh, one of the papers has Frank Polman, who will be here in a week or so. So you can hear about, uh, that's a little bit advanced, but he might mention it. Okay. <clears throat> uh, okay, so it's a little bit different to think about, okay, these the states up here, those are at high temperature. Well, you don't have to isolate an individual eigenstate to do high temperature. You just have to do combinations of them in the right way. So we do have a number of ways of doing finite temperature that are quite nice. Okay, I'm going to show you just a few slides just so you see what you've just been hearing in it, you know, in my, sort of the usual way of talking about it. There's a few extra details. So why is the entanglement of ground state small? Okay, so I give you, gave you the picture of the RVB. 
But there's also a quantum information idea called monogamy of an entanglement, which basically says that if you really entangle two things together here, neither one can be entangled with anybody else. Monogamy means you just stay married to one partner. So you can't have polygamous marriages in quantum entanglement. It doesn't work. And um, so this is a sort of well-developed theory, and that helps explain uh, part of the area law. It's like once this guy is bound to that guy, it can't talk to anybody over here. Okay? <clears throat> and the rest we talked a little bit about. Okay, so here's the Schmidt decomposition the way I usually explain it in a brief fashion. You know, cutting the system in two, entanglement entropy. We've just gone through that. Exploiting the low entanglement in the 1D case. Cutting the system in two, sort of inserting complete sets of, or incomplete sets of Schmidt states at each point to get the matrix product state. Okay, and then this one has a little animation thing, super crude. Um, it just shows how you move back and forth, improving the wave function on two sites. Okay, a little, th little more carefully drawn. Matrix. Oh, so there's one thing that I should have mentioned. The other way of writing, instead of just jumping to the diagrams, here's the other way of writing a matrix product state. <clears throat> it, uh, so this A1, A2, AN, you think of as a matrix with an extra label on it. Um, which is just like the poly spin matrices. They are matrices that have an XYZ label on them. So here's an extra label on them that is in the square brackets, and it's just the value of the spin. So you can think of it as like a pair of matrices. Um, <clears throat> and so the rule for getting the, the wave function code, the value for a particular S1, S2, Sn. You know, if, if we have the rule for a function is that, okay, you give me particular values of S1, S2, et cetera, say all up, then I can tell you the number. Okay, so the way that rule works is you give me these numbers, the square brackets will pick one particular matrix, and you multiply them all together, and the first and last are a vector, and it collapses to one number. But what that number it is depends on the S's, because there's really two guys at each place, and you had to pick which one. And that's what gives you, the, that's how the compression works. It uh, just has these matrices, but it can give you every possible value in expanding it out. Okay. Okay, so how well does this work? So this is a 2000 site spin one half Heisenberg chain. Um, didn't have any extra disorder. Um, now, for the Heisenberg chains, there's an exact solution due to Hans Bethe back in 1931 or so. And uh, it also works for finite chains or infinite chains, but here use it for finite chains. You have to write a little program to evaluate the answer. But you can know the exact uh, energy and, and a few excited states. So the left hand picture is showing the energy, that's an E. It's the total energy of the system is 1,000 sites, so it's a big number. And the M is how many Schmidt states I was keeping. And there was sweeping back and forth. And the index I is where you are in the sweep. Now, it's 2,000 sites. This only goes to the center. And then it uses reflection symmetry to replace the right-hand side with the left, and it sort of then can turn around. So a little bit of efficiency. OK, so you do m equals 10, then you, you, you sort of get that converged. Then you increase to m equals 15. The energy goes down. Change it to m equals 20. And you, the way you typically do this is you slowly increase the size of the matrices, which is the same as the number of Schmidt states. You slowly increase them until you get whatever convergence you want. And uh, so then the stars here are the exact ground state. And uh, you know a whole bunch of sweeps have just sort of sat there at the scale. Then the right-hand side is showing the deviation in the total energy from uh, the exact beta onslaught's an answer. Okay. And uh, so as you increase the size of the matrices, it's falling. 
this exponential scale, and it's the total energy, it's not per site. So this is a really accurate wave function. <clears throat> and uh, it's got some curvature here, but it sort of straightens out once you're below the first excited state. Um, this is a gapless system, a critical system, and so this would be a system that, that's hard to do because uh, gapless systems have long-range uh, correlations, and so they're considered hard. But because it's not tr strictly infinite, it's only 2,000 sites, there's a very tiny finite size energy gap. And as soon as you iterate so that your energy is below that first state, it starts looking like a gap system, and then DMRG tends to converge exponentially well for gap systems, and so it sort of goes to a straight line. And, you know, of course, we could push this to uh, um, more accuracy. How big an M can we do on a, you know, uh, on a desktop? You know, maybe M equals 5,000, something like that. So you can make this essentially exact to all digits that you might have on the double precision. <clears throat> Uh, so for 1D systems, DMRG sort of um, is the, you know, gets you what you want very accurately, sort of the best method around. Um, we've learned how to get other properties that are of interest in experiment. So finite temperature, um, spectral functions, dynamics, um, out of equilibrium dynamics, things with disorder. Some things are harder than, a lot harder than this, but we know how to do a pretty good job on lots of different things. <clears throat> okay, so here's uh, my usual introduction to uh, diagrams for matrix product states. You've seen that. Here's, here's one where if you connect them up, it actually gives you a trace, and then they're all matrices. Matrix product state. Uh, matrix product states is variational states. I didn't talk much about Calculating observables. Okay, so you have this comb state, this matrix product state, and you want to calculate a property. The way you measure something is there's two wave functions. There's a psi on the right and the psi on the left, and you have to do a, uh, a contraction. So the way it looks in the diagrams is you put the first, the guy on the right on the bottom, and the guy on the left on the top. And you contract them together, and contracting is summing over all the values of the spins. So that just links up all of the lines. But, and if you just did all, all of them linked up with nothing in between, it would just be the normalization, and you'd get one. But if you want to measure something, you insert a spin operator at that particular place. Or if you want to measure a product of two things, you insert two of them. And then when you contract over everything, it gives you a number, and that's just that particular property. So with this, you can calculate correlation functions, and lots of other things. It doesn't matter how many pieces you put in here, but um, it has to be sort of, you know, in this simple way, it should just be one term. Okay, so there's often diagrams that look sort of like this with things um, contracted top and bottom and then other things in between. There's another, uh, let me see if I've got that in a slide. I guess I don't have it. <clears throat> so let me just mention it. You can also put the Hamiltonian in between here. And you can write the Hamiltonian as something that looks like a matrix product state. It's called a matrix product operator. And you'll see that a little bit in uh, this afternoon in the iTensor, um, uh, the, the iTensor library, because that's the usual way the Hamiltonian is handled with iTensor. So uh, uh, a uh, matrix product operator, let me just draw it in the diagram. So here's the usual comb for a matrix product state. The basic unit looks like that. And this is an MPS. And a matrix product operator, an MPO, looks like this. Okay, so this is like S1, S2. Let me end it. S1, S1 prime. S2, S2 prime. Okay, so this this general, if I, if I make this into a box, this can represent any operator on those spins. Okay? But it turns out you can compress the ham usual Hamiltonian operators to make them look like this. They have the same sort of 
structure of tensors as up here, they typically have pretty small bond dimensions, pretty small uh, m, like 5. Um, and so you can write the whole Hamiltonian in this form. And the, the fact that it looks like this guy means it just fits into the algorithm really easily. So you can write an algorithm that just assumes that you figured out the Hamiltonian like this. And then you do all the, all the programming with this totally arbitrary. And then you only have the Hamiltonian, the system you're doing, coming into one part of the calculation. Everything else kind of looks the same. <clears throat> okay, so MPOs are one of the big advances of the last uh, 10 years or so in terms of organizing DMRG programs and making them easier. <clears throat> okay. Okay. Um, I want to skip matrix product bases. That connects a little bit to the old RG way of thinking about things. Okay, and this is what I talked about comparing with the old way of thinking about RG and the new way. So I want to skip this also. Okay, so uh, let me uh, talk a little bit about doing DMRG for uh, 2D systems. Okay, so this will just be uh, sort of an overview, show a few things of interest. Okay, <clears throat> so the algorithm that I presented was all for a one-dimensional chain. And it really used that because it kept splitting up the system on each bond. Okay, so suppose we wanted to do DMRG for 2D systems. Well, <clears throat> if the 2D system is infinite, uh, you're out of luck. But if, it, if you want to do a strip, and then you can do wider strips and, and see what the trend is as an approximation to an infinite 2D, you can do this sort of scheme. This is sometimes called a snake. But you can take, here's this 2D grid. It's only five wide here. But I make it into 1D just by connecting the sites up with the blue lines. Okay, And it uh, then looks like a 1D system. Uh, but it has longer range bonds. So for instance, the first site is connected very strongly to site number six on the path. Okay, that's, uh, that's something that you don't usually get with a true 1D system. Okay, all of these connections take you sort of deep into the other system, and it messes up the area law, the 1D area law. It's saying, oh yeah, I got something inside the system here talking to a guy inside the other system. Now, it doesn't go infinitely far across. It sort of only goes five across. So it messes it up a little bit. But you have to think about this as a 2D system to find out how well DMRG is going to work. And so you do a cut like this and say, OK, how big is the area? Well, the number of sites on the boundary is five. So the entanglement should be bigger by a factor of five than in 1D. Well, a factor of five doesn't sound too bad. Run it five times as long, except it's an exponential. It's a fifth power. So it actually gets much harder. So the, the, the number of states that you have to keep, m, will go as some exponential of the width of the system. So at first, people, some people thought that you wouldn't be able to do DMRG at all for 2D systems. But it turns out that this exponential is, you know, effectively the, the A coefficient is fairly small. So you can do a reasonably big system without, um, without running out of numerical power. Um, you, they become big calculations, but uh, if you keep, say, up to M equals 10,000, then you can do a, a system of, you know, with 10 or 14 for these spin systems, which is really pretty big. And it could be a cylinder, so it's connected with periodic boundary conditions that helps reduce the finite size effects. And so that can be enough to get really good answers for some 2D systems. Um, it depends exactly on how much is going on on one site. So the simplest case is if there's spin 1 half, and so there's only two possibilities. And so the area law coefficient is especially small. Um, if you had a Hubbard model, there's four states on each site. 
That's like twice as hard. You can only do half as wide a system. Yes. Sorry, I couldn't. So <clears throat> there, I'm assuming that the 2D system has nearest neighbor connections. And then I put a number, you know, that's number one, go down to five. Uh, oh, so I guess the way this is numbered, it goes up to 10. So there is a nearest neighbor connection that connects actually sites one and 10. And that would be as long as it gets in this arrangement. I could have made it go down and then jump back up to the top and go down again. And then it would only be five away or six away. Um, so it's, it's not so far. Right. So a 2D finite strip is the same as a 1D system with long range interactions. Okay, but the entanglement is that of the 2D system. It is the same. We use the simple 2D system to estimate the entanglement. We look at this picture. It is equivalent. They're always all equivalent to a 1D system with long enough bonds. So part of the DMRG algorithm doesn't care that it's 2D. You write the same code. But then you find that it doesn't converge very well with only 10 states or 100 states. You have to crank it up to a lot more states to get good accuracy. So it sort of knows that it's really two-dimensional. Well, <clears throat> if each dot, so, so the, the little guys sticking out here, that, those are the degrees of freedom of the site. And they're not labeled here. You know, I'm thinking about them as up and down. So each little angled thing is up or down. If it was Hubbard, it would be empty, up electron, down electron, or doubly occupied. So there'd be four possibilities. Okay, so there'd be, it'd be the same picture, but there would be more entanglement because of those extra degrees of freedom. You know, it's got spin fluctuations and charge fluctuations, sort of twice as many. Yeah. Well, I haven't drawn all the bonds, the horizontal bonds that are in there. Yeah, yeah, that's, I guess that's, uh, that's unclear. So it's a 2D system. So the, all those horizontal bonds are really there in the Hamiltonian. But they look like long range bonds in the matrix product state snake. Okay, so I've talked about DMRG. Um, since uh, people from quantum information came along, uh, particularly, let me mention some names. Guifre Vidal found sort of the, so one of the first key connections between quantum information and, uh, and DMRG. He sort of reinvented part of DMRG without knowing about it. Um, and then uh, Ignacio Serac and Frank Verstrada were two of the other key people that started in quantum information and now are, um, I have done a lot of major work in this uh, improving DMRG. And um, so to do two dimensions, here's this thing that I just showed you. But there's, if, as soon as you start drawing the diagrams, you can draw a better tensor network uh, like this one that really directly represents 2D. So a basic tensor here has five legs, not three. It has the one coming out, which has up or down, and then it has north, south, east, west, the four directions. And <clears throat> um, it doesn't have a snake path. It directly represents 2D. So there's a tensor leg that connects every nearest neighbor. Well, that matches what the Hamiltonian has. It's a much more natural representation. Um, it allows much better compression of the wave function. Okay, so DMRG, DMRG is equivalent to this in 1D. You know, there's, there's three legs in each. Um, in 
in these strips, thing, the entropy starts blowing up um, with the width, and so your M has to blow up. In PEPs, the M doesn't have to change very much. And so uh, you might have M equals 10 and get a pretty good answer. And um, so it, it's more difficult because it has more legs, so that's still a lot of coefficients, but it's a much better compression. So this has been a very promising algorithm since uh, you know, the early 2000s, about 10, 10 or 15 years ago when it was proposed. However, it's much more difficult to work with numerically. And in particular, you know, we talked about estimating the calculation time of an algorithm. You know, diagonalizing a matrix is m cubed. Well, you know, in DMRG, that m cubed is the biggest piece. So the calculation time in DMRG is m cubed times a few factors involving the size of the system. Okay, in this case, the calculation time, it's much harder to work with this and you get up to m to the 12th. Uh, it's, um, it's not exponential. And, you know, exponential is the worst, except that depending on the coefficient, m to the 12th is worse than an exponential for quite a while. And uh, so this is the key difficulty of working with PEPs. Um, and so it took quite a while to, for this to turn into something that's really useful. Now it is, but there's still just a couple of group, or, well, there's mostly Philippe Corbeau who has the nicest work with this sort of PEPs. And, uh, and uh, it's uh, just very difficult calculations. There's a number of groups now that do two dimensions with DMRG because it's, it's almost like the same sort of coding as in 1D. <clears throat> um, so these two sorts of methods are, are, they're both, they're cousins. You know, they're both based on this sort of matrix product state or the generalization. The, the whole field is tensor networks. And uh, so they're close cousins, just adapted for different things. Um, one of the things that you can do with this is you can actually make the lattice go out to infinity. And the way you do that is you just say, well, let me make every tensor the same. And then just assert it goes out to infinity. And then the question is, well, can you work with that and actually evaluate properties? And it turns out you can. And so it's amazing that you can actually sort of do numerical works, not with a finite size effect, but it's strictly infinite. And a lot, that's what uh, uh, Philippe's work uh, does. It goes out to infinity. And uh, so that's, that's a neat thing. But uh, you still have this M, you know, the, the biggest M that I've uh, seen Philippe have is uh, maybe 14 or so. Um, and uh, so it's sort of competitive with uh, the best DMRG work. Okay. Okay. Uh, so I am going to save this uh, for later, and uh, we can take any more questions, and otherwise we can break for lunch. Yes. Well, you, you have a different, slightly different PEPs for different lattices. Um, it, for instance, for the Kagame lattice, which has an interesting structure, um, it took a little while to figure out that putting a tensor on every site wasn't the best thing to do. And so the Kagame lattice has little triangles that touch on corners, and they put a tensor in the center of each triangle. And then that works better, a lot better. And so each thing you have to figure out a little bit, the best, it's still a pretty general purpose method, but these subtle little differences that have to be worked out. More questions? Yes. So we always use the commuting symmetries. So if it's a spin system, we keep track of S sub Z. If it's a fermion system, like the Hubbard model, we would keep track of two numbers, the number of particles and the total S sub Z. Other groups have put in full SU2 symmetry, which 
means that you can work with a smaller M, um, and it's like you're working with a big, bigger M by maybe a factor of 10 or something. So that's a, that's a nice thing to do when you have that symmetry. It's also a much more complicated program, and, um, um, you know, and many systems don't have the symmetries that would make it work. So we haven't, our group doesn't do it, but other groups are, have, you know, some systems they do better than us because they put in the full SU2 symmetry. And there are other, other symmetries that you can put in. It's difficult to put in the spatial symmetry that you might want to put in because as you step through the lattice, you're breaking it up. You're killing the symmetry. And uh, so spatial symmetries are much harder, but uh, the sort of local symmetries are, you, you sort of do as much as you can that's convenient. Okay, <clears throat> so we, we gather again at two in the computer labs. Okay.